Thanks for staying with us on News Hub. We're taking a look at issues, three topical issues this week. We're taking a look at the economic recession in the country. Uh, the federal government has to um, pass with the strike still ongoing at this point in time. We'll also be taking a look at the fight against violence uh, uh, against women, so to speak, which the United Nations celebrates every November 25 every year. Uh, before the break, I was sticking you on, on the insincerity. We were just talking about data, having data and people thinking that those doubtful of those data in the country. So how then do business people, private sector, public sector, you know, deploy such information to help them plan uh, the businesses so that we can e experience economic growth and development uh, in the nation. So you were on, on one thought then. Uh, the same question will also go to you also, Dr. Wallum, uh, after uh, is the early change in the studio. So please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, what, is, what we do when we grow? We grow up like in the dark. Even the government, the private sector grew up because you don't have any data to work on and it's very dangerous. You don't have any data I mean, or so you don't no, have the no, data no, We don't have trust. realistic data to work on. Yeah, there are figures being bandied around by the NBS and other groups from the population figure to the number of unemployment rate to the, I mean, the inflation rate, everything is out there. But then how realistic are these things? You see, we're discussing recession globally. When there's a recession, there is a, uh, infl the interest rates go down, prices come down. Now, and this, like I said, recession is a technical word. If in Nigeria we have a situation whereby the interest rates are still going through the roof, prices are still skyrocketing, can we call what we have a recession? It does not tally. What would you call it? I mean, what they can call it? I mean, there, there's a contraction in the GDP for the past two quarters. But elsewhere in the world, because it's not a Nigerian concept, it's a global concept, recession. Elsewhere in the world where you have this contraction, in the, because there's low demand, prices tend to crash, interest rates tend to also come down. But if the only thing that we are having in Nigeria is a contraction of the GDP, but interest rates are still going through the roof, prices are still jumping sky high, can we really call it a recession? I mean, this is for the economics to say, but like I said, we have, there has to be sincerity in government. And when the government is sincere, then we may now tag along. But as of now, I think the when government has to work on its um, sincerity index because that is the most critical index okay. that they have to the work trust, on. The trust component is very key in yes. all of this. Let's, let's, let's take it home for on an um, issue around the recession. Uh, Dr. Gif Wolu, uh, could you just highlight for us a few steps that you think um, uh, government can take? I, I, I take it up from where Eze Luce started. He talked about uh, 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 cost of governance, reduction in cost of governance. Could you highlight a few more steps you think government can take uh, in getting us out of this um, recession? Um, the, the other steps that government need to take, uh, of course, there are several steps. Um, first, we need to begin to look at Nigeria as a system with many parts. There's the political part, there's the religious part, there's the ethnic part, there's the uh, economic part technological part, and so on and so forth. When you take that holistic view of a system, and you begin to see how each of these parts work together to achieve a common purpose, then we'll be getting it right. That's one. But what I find in Nigeria is that most times, we isolate these issues, treat the economy as if it is not connected to the politics, and treat the politics as if it is not connected to religion. The other thing that we need to talking economically is um, the ease of doing business in Nigeria. We need to improve the ease of doing business in Nigeria. We need to also, when it comes to data, when we provide, when we produce, um, or put forward data to the people. For example, every year Nigeria does budget, and they will call it one beautiful name, uh, maybe budget of consolidation, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of the year, we don't do review. We don't ask ourselves, did we really consolidate based on our objectives of budget of consolidation? Is it just about wanting to look good or what? Our education is important. We need to educate people. We need to educate the young child. We need to educate every member of the population so that people have the skill and knowledge with which they can tap into the progress of government and participate and benefit from what government is doing. We also need to, like he said, reduce the cost of governance. There are many special assistants, PAs, SAs. See, for me, if we had these people doing some piece of work and adding value, I would, I would probably would not be talking about the cost of governance being high. 
But what we are doing is that there is no return on investment, so to say, on these people that we appoint. So you have so many people working for government, and then at the end of the day, it doesn't see much that government is producing. In other parts of the world, like in America, it's possible that they have more people working in their government than we can ever think of in Nigeria. But the point is that for everybody who is employed by government, there's a job for you to do. And you are employed on the basis of the realization that you have value to add, that you have the capacity and you have the you know, intelligence to be able to do that job. But some people are appointed, they don't do anything, but at the end of the, the month, they collect money. And then the work of government is not done. So when we begin to think seriously about our economy, Nigerian leaders will begin to, when they see the data, see if you tell people that over 70 percent of Nigerians live below the poverty line. That's hard information. That's something you cannot go to sleep with that kind of information. If you are serious and if you are sincere to the people as a leader, and then if you don't go to sleep throughout the night, you should be thinking of what you need to do to gradually get the people out of that you know, situation. But we don't see much of that. So you see government spending money, behaving as if all is well, and telling the people, you know, that uh, we are in recession. We cannot be in recession okay. and not be in recession uh, at the same time. So if uh, we are in recession, government should do what government should do, get people who understand these things to advise government so that they can put in place programs, get the people to tap into those programs. And then at the end of the day, we can gradually get ourselves I thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wall. Uh, remember that you're free to be part of this program. It is open day and you can bear your thoughts on any of the topics that we have today. Let's, let's bring it back to the studios, uh, Dr. Eluchi. Let's move to the next one, uh, which is the federal government and uh, versus ASU, as we've been, been putting it this way. It's been nine months uh, and young people are being at home. Uh, the people, the students who were, who were lucky enough to have parents who could send them to the private universities, uh, uh, they're, they're fine, so to speak. And it seems that there is no end. As that, uh, on Thursday, we're thinking that today we have good news. Uh, what, what have you been able to make of the federal government as to arm pass? And um, how can we just get this one done with so that the young people can go back to school and study? Well, it's a uh, very unfortunate situation. Um, we seem not to have uh, interest in our future because these young people are the future of Nigeria. And they, for the past eight months, all universities, uh, high institutions have been closed. And uh, go, those in government feel free. They feel okay and they can continue to perambulate or gallivant around. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. The, the, there is a total disconnect between those in government and the population. Because most of these people who are in government have their children schooling abroad. So, I mean, like, I just saw the picture of the National University Commission chairperson attending his son's graduation in the United Kingdom. Virtually all the governors, the ministers have their children in the UK, the Minister of Education, and everybody has their children abroad. So they don't give a damn what happens. In fact, it was only during the NSAS protests that the government even picked up interest in continuing discussion with us because they realized that so many youths were at home doing nothing. So let us, in fact, during the, ASU, during the NSAS protest, the minister announced that the schools will resume about one or two weeks thereafter because they now noticed that, okay, these young men were on the streets, they were idle, not doing nothing. That this, this thing has continued for eight months is a shame. See, that's why I keep on talking about the need for sincerity of government. You, you can't be telling people they're in recession and then the, the very future of our country is rotting away. But, but why don't we just even uh, address the fact, the demands of ASU from the federal government and what the federal government is you know, offering to yes. give so that there could be a truth in this particular situation. I mean, both it, of them can continue no, you know, the, the issue at loggerheads. We, 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 have, we, have, we have warped sense of priorities. Professors, lecturers are so poorly paid. You put somebody <laughs> fights his way or rigs his way into the National Assembly or becomes a governor and overnight he becomes a billionaire. The cost, it would almost take, 
a professor of 10 lifetimes to earn what kind of salaries these members of the National Assembly or the presidency earn. So we have a warped sense of priority. We do not want to invest in the education of our next generation next. So what that translates to directly is that our future is mortgaged, our future is jeopardized. Huh. And I'm, I'm not just looking at the ASU crisis just is like a tip of the iceberg because it, it, it actually brings to the fore that these people who are ruling us, like if you are a father, if you are a, a parent and your child is sitting at home stagnant for the past eight months, you will not sleep yeah. because you know you have a volcano. But these guys in government, they don't give a damn. Okay. Let's, 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 it's, it's most unfortunate. Let's, let's speak with Dr. Dr. Gifts on, on this matter. As to strike nine months, um, a complete a whole session completely wiped off, uh, given to strike. Uh, the issues are on ground. We, we had the privilege of speaking with the national president of um, ASU right here in our studios. And then uh, uh, he, he, says, he, said, he said that uh, the concern here is not only about, uh, about um, salaries. It's not about um, salary and platforms of payment and the rest of them. That they are also looking at the issues around um, lack of attention for education infrastructures key these are all key conversations that we had uh, you are uh, you are a nigerian let's begin to balance this up is would you do you really think it's about infrastructure or do you think it's about salaries and salary salary platforms has been uh, put up there by government i would say it's it's a problem of the way we do things in this part of the world ordinarily the asu federal government crisis, which has become one too many, is avoidable. Avoidable in the sense that some of the things we are talking about are not things that people cannot easily relate with. I don't see why people who are in government, you know, cannot easily understand it when the point is made that uh, more attention should be paid to education. Because the, the bedrock of development, we say, is education. If we want peace, if we want security in our country, we must educate our people. Because when we educate people, they have the skill, they have the knowledge, they have the empowerment to be able to eke out a living. But when people are on, not educated, when people, and I'm not talking about formal education only, even the informal education is important. So that at the end of the day, we create a system in which everybody manages to find a livelihood. So when we don't prioritize education, when we don't put our money where our mouth is, and one of the key areas where our mouth is, is education, we can now see why people will allow these kinds of things to be happening. And sometimes it borders only on the way decisions are made and communicated. So if we're talking about, for example, the issue of payment platform, what stopped the government from involving ASU and other stakeholders from the one in developing that platform? So that maybe by now we should be talking about testing it to see how it accommodates the interests of all the stakeholders, especially ASU and lecturers. And then if it is not working, we find a way to get another platform to change this current one that is problematic. So it's about decision making. It's about whether you are willing to allow people to participate in decision making, which is what happens all over the world today, or you want to insist on the traditional way of decision making where the chief executive or the leader, you know, is believed to have the prerogative for decision making. If we allow people who will be affected by a decision to be part of that decision, of course, you, you can be rest assured that they, they, they will key into it, they will um, accept it, they will work to see it you know, uh, materialize. But when government thinks that they can just do whatever they like, whether government lecturers like it or not, it's not their business. And when you are dealing with a class of people like lecturers, these people are educated. These people can somehow manage to survive, no matter what government tries to do. It don't expect them to swallow hook, line, and sinker, whatever people you know throw at them. 
Now, when it comes to the issue of communication, even when I listen to the Labour Minister talk about these issues, you don't see, you know, that um, you don't see that commitment. You don't see somebody who is talking to a people with a view to getting them to come sit down with him, understand his point of view, and then he understands their point of view, and they are working towards amicably resolving the issues. Like the, the, the uh, president of ASU said, the issues are not about salary, and it has never been about ASU, uh, salary, because when ASU even presents their demands, salary and things pertaining to emoluments for lecturers comes around number seven or eight, sometimes nine and 10. And that is where even some lecturers are not too happy with their, their leaders in ASU. But okay. government will not take advantage of the fact that these people are talking about how do we create a system in which the people that you even have as lecturers are happy being lecturers and therefore doing their work to their best, utmost possible. You okay. are not thinking about, you know, having reagents in our laboratories. You're not thinking about, you know, um, giving research grants to enable lecturers to right. do research in okay. the economy. So when these things are brought to fore by ASU, and all that government does is to try to find a way to coerce them into going back to the classroom. It leaves much to be desired. And that's all right, doctor. Said... All right, Dr. Gift. Before we start taking the calls, let's let you know that Abuja guest has joined us. Uh, that's uh, Eze Uyikiri. He has joined us uh, right now. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us on the program. All right. Thank you so much for being part of the program. If you can hear me, uh, we've been... Okay, David. Uh, right now. Uh, Dr. Ezio Nyepere will come to you in a bit, but before then, let's take this, this phone call. Yes, hello, good morning, caller. See, we have three tiers of government in this country, federal, state, local government. But today, federal has been doing its little effort by consulting law, paying salary to civil servants in federal and other things. But state government today, in my state, Araba State, that I'm speaking to you, our governor now refused to pay local government, primary school teacher, pensioner, and every month he has been collecting allocation. And we have not seen anything he has done. See, crisis we are, we are going through, crisis of ethnic uh, uh, tribes between Thief and Jukum, uh, headsmen, and, and the rest of them. Then now, see, Every month, this man has been collecting a location for a people and he cannot pay salary. Then this issue of ASU, I want to say that I blame politicians, I blame the ASU. Because this jumbo pay that these politicians get, what have they been doing? They don't do anything. The school politicians they should place them on, bail, uh, on salary bail level, just like if you can someone start from zero level, to the last level. Politicians should be like that. If not, they will consume all the resources that God bless this country. Okay. And, all right. And, and Ed, will be continue happening because few people Ed, have been taking what belongs to millions of people. Edward. Um, all right. Um, let's take this other call. We have we have another caller coming in right now from uh, from uh, Edo State. Uh, exactly. We we have a caller coming in. Good morning. Yeah, so on the issue of uh, ASU strike, I think um, the lecturers want to bring a change in the system in this country, of education in this country, because you find out, like one of the um, speakers in the studio said, these people who call our leaders do not have interest in the education of our people, of our young people. And find out that some of them, even though they didn't go to school, some of them have, don't have good certificates and they claim they have, if they understand what it means to go to school, what we really want this nation to look like in the next few years should be achieved through giving proper attention to education of our young people. He said the leader, I mean, the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. If they are not well educated, they cannot take on the responsibility that we are going to give up, hand over to them. So proper attention should be given to education. Go to our schools, there are nothing to write home about. No proper infrastructure, 
no good benefit package for our electorate. So the leaders of our country should give education priority attention. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bankole, for that intervention. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's speak with Eze Onyekwere, who has just joined us in our Buja studio. Uh, good morning, Eze Onyekwere. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Yes. Uh, uh, whilst we were waiting, whilst you were not in the studio, we have had some conversation. Uh, you just met the ASU conversation. Before, now, we, we talked about the recession. Now, because I know you're an economist, I would want to go back and just get your view on the recession and the possible way out of the recession. Well, I would rather like to start on the last topic, which is the ASU discussion, because uh, without education, there's even no economy in the first place. I think that to weigh in there, ASU have been on this business for close to nine months or thereabout. And we have a supposedly elected government that allows public universities to close down for this long period of time. And uh, we have a legislature as well that is also sitting. And we have citizens. Everybody is quiet. And we get this kind of discussions. I blame government. I blame ASU. Did you elect ASU officials? Are there no people working for an honest pay? How much is the salary of a professor? 300, 400,000? After being at the height of his career, not just an ordinary career, a career that involves knowledge creation, a career that involves educating the future, a career that involves uh, improving the greatest resource any nation can have, which is a human resource. It's not even about your crude oil or your cars, which is a resource, because it is a human being that drains that crude oil from the balls of the earth. It is a human being that will build aeroplanes, cars that will go to the moon or do agriculture. So if you don't give education priority, what exactly are you prioritizing? And then we even have a situation where a minister was trying to ridicule lecturers. So we need more of farmers than lecturers. Who trained the farmer in the first place to do productive farming? So we are misplacing our priorities. We cannot be treating education as if to say it is any other thing. And we have our best in the education. Those who we are always coming first in the class, sitting in the front pew of the class, they are the ones who today become professors. And not those dollars who now maybe are occupying, I'm sorry to have used that word, positions of power. So I will think that the issue is not even about the payment system. The issue is about the attitude, the approach, of the current government and even previous governments to education. Of course, most of them have their children in uh, universities out of the country. The few that are still in Nigeria are schooling in private universities. So what is their personal interest? What do they have at stake? Nothing, absolutely, absolutely nothing. So I don't think we should call the lecturers to blame. We shouldn't blame them. We have a government in place. Government must respond to the demands of these lecturers. And come to think of it, while the little money available to education is there, we are even wasting it. Look at what is happening in the defense sector. We have a national, the NDA in Kaduna, which is a degree awarding institution. We have the National War College, which is a, 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 a degree awarding institution in Abuja here. Then you are going to build and establish an army university. Somebody somewhere establishes an Air Force University in Kaduna. And then the Minister of Aviation is asking for money to establish aerospace university. What is there in the Army University? What is there in the Air Force University that cannot be accommodated in a degree awarding institution like India or National War College? You waste the little resources, spread them too thin. Instead of increasing the carrying capacity of a, 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 a existing institutions, you continue wasting the resources and expect magic to happen. So the government must change its approach and attitude to education because it's a fundamental training institution to build those who will even help the economy to grow and bring us out of recession in the future. All right, uh, Mr. Oyekpere, before you, we move to other issues, before you joined us, there was uh, a submission by our guests, especially Mr. Uh, in the studios here, who, your namesake, who said that the, the data being churned out by the government uh, apparatus in the country to handle our economy are not trustworthy. What do you think? Do you trust the data, the information that are there from the MBS, from the CBN, and other, uh, perhaps even the, the stock market will always give us correct or right? So do you trust uh, in, the, in the figures that we have? 
we will we'll take a very short break. Uh, Mr. When we come back, we'll take that answer from you. Just stay with us on News Hub. You can now stream Silverbird News 24 live on mobile app. All you need to do is to download Silverbird News 24 app from Google Play Store on your Android devices and App Store or on your Apple devices. Tap the live button at the bottom bar to watch us live 24-7. You can enjoy all our news programs including PJ News and program. Silverbird News 24. The news never stops. For more news stories, kindly visit our website www.silverbednews24.com. You can also watch trending news videos on our YouTube channel. We are just a click away on WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Get the news in your prime on your mobile phone by downloading Silverbed News 24 from your Play or App Store. File in your witness report on our website or send an email to silverbedn24 at gmail.com. Thanks for staying with us. It's still open day on News Hub this lovely Friday and it's all about you. Uh, you can, you're free to call in and be part of the program. See the topics we, are, we have up for discussion today. Uh, we're taking a look at the economic recession in the country, uh, the federal government and ASU uh, impasse, as well as uh, the fight against uh, fight on eliminating violence against women in our society. Before that break, I was speaking with you, uh, Mr. Eze Oyekwere in our Abuja studios there. Uh, the question is something that many Nigerians want an answer to, diverse answers, but we want the truth. Do you trust the data that are churned out by, for instance, the National Bureau of Statistics, CBN, all the people managing our economy in the country, uh, in the to the extent that we can trust them when they give us any policy statement or any issue around our economy in the country? Well, let me start by saying that we must distinguish between two types of data or information that is churned out by government. There are professional groups like the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, uh, and I think that the figures they churn out to tell us when we have uh, entered into a recession to give us growth numbers like they did in the second and third quarter, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they look reliable. There are also information and statistics coming from the central bank in the management of monetary policy. Uh, to an extent also, I think that they are reliable. But if we are talking about general information and propaganda maybe coming out from the Ministry of Information or similar agencies, that's a different ballgame altogether. But even as at that, the information and data that is coming out from agencies like the Bureau of Statistics is not doctored. It's bad enough. They've told us that we have already entered a recession. They've told us uh, the inflation rate is in double digit, 14 point something. Uh, they've given us the unemployment figures, which is 20 something percent. So even as the figures are, assuming that even they were doctor, they are bad enough. So there is nothing that we can be complaining about. They are so bad that all we need to do is to be thinking of strategies or of how we can get out of them. And then if anybody thinks that the, the, the statistics is bad, it's not credible then let us have some indicators to be able to measure and judge. But my, but my opinion is that as they are now, they are bad enough to raise the alarm bells. We've been told we are the poverty capital of the world. Even the poverty statistics coming from MBS more or less confirm it. So there is really nothing to say about whether it is credible or not. 
from the point of view of government and from alternative facts that we've had from our establishments, they are bad enough. So we can work on them to make them better. Third, um, Dr. Oyekpere. Um, but then, uh, let me take you back to getting out of recession. The Minister for Finance had just uh, very optimistic that come first quarter of 2021, that Europe should exit uh, uh, this recession. Now, you, we all understand that uh, most of these uh, uh, predictions are based on uh, maybe expectations from oil revenue, not necessarily the growth of the real sector. Uh, how, 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 can, how would you react to this? Well, as a Nigerian who lives here, whose future and fortunes are tied to this country, I will honestly join the minister and pray and wish that we get out of recession as quickly as possible uh, in the first quarter of 2021. But I'm not so sure that we may necessarily get out of it in the first quarter, because like you did say about hoping on the price of crude oil, which is not something we control, is beyond uh, making, whether it goes for 20 or $40. Cool. That's not what we should be uh, hoping on. And the areas, a few growth drivers that we can rely on, things like agriculture, unfortunately, we have a situation where the terrorism and the insurgency in the Northeast and Northwest, and to an extent getting into the Middle Belt, is dragging these things down. Because people can no longer go to the farm because of fear of being kidnapped or killed or raped or maimed. And uh, even the insurgents in the Northwest are asking people for a fee to, uh, so that they can allow them to go to their farms to be able to have it. So agriculture as a growth driver, which will have allowed, allowed us to add more value and begin even to drive the agricultural value chain by improving it from raw produce to finished and semi-finished products, we are having a key challenge with it. M Mr. And then, one moment. I, I've noted your cue out. Just one moment. Let's speak with Chris, uh, who's calling us from Enugu State. Uh, good morning, Chris. Thanks for joining us on News Hub. Uh, I've been listening to the program this morning about economic recession and it, as, I, as I've been going up in this country, I'm about 60 years, I'm about 56 or 57 years. I'm trying to understand this, our contract, if those are operating on like a mechanic board, you will learn in the trade. You do not know very well. You started to get yourself free. I started uh, gambling with the car engines and the working as if uh, to out of the majority. So I think we still suffering from writing this and I'm cutting back our mind, I'm writing this. How Nigeria has been battling with uh, tribalism, uh, nepotism, religious uh, sentiment. This has been our problem. All these things we are talking about. Okay, Chris, can we, we can just go home with this? Uh, just uh, yeah, round off yeah. in just five seconds, yes. You need okay. to round off. What lessons. I'm trying to say is we are still battling with Ukraine and your independence. And we do not learn anything. We enter into independence and we have been battling under six years, six or seven years. We, we have to fight. The spirit right. of battle of civilian and of a civil war is still in our minds. Anybody who is talking from every point, for, for, uh, Nigeria is talking about a lot of nationality. All right, uh, Chris. Thank you so much for being part of the program this morning. Uh, please, Mr. Yekere, can you please continue with your line of thoughts? That's Saying that is. agriculture, which you have offered us a lot of hope, there are challenges with it, especially coming from the security angle. Yes, it's possible for us to exit recession as quickly as possible, but a few fundamental things need to be done. Uh, one, we have to rejig our expenditure priorities and know exactly where we need to put it down. We have to cut down on the cost of running the bureaucracy and governance, and we must begin to invest in very, very key priorities. Now, the idea that Nigeria is a rich country is a lie. Everybody knows it that we are not rich. We must open up the system in a, such a fundamental way that citizens begin to trust the government. And it's only when citizens begin to trust the government that more people will be way, willing to pay their tax, and more people will be willing to make contributions. And through that process, the government is there, citizens are there, private sector are there, it will be there. Everybody will join hands to make the contribution, but not just the kind of things we are hearing or reading in the newspapers about the possibility of the finance bill saying, oh, people who just made donations because of COVID, you have to grant them tax reliefs immediately as if to say it's a quick procure, as if to say that was even the basis for them 
to make that donation in the first place, not the kind of ideas that is being thrown up that you increase the uh, mobilization fee to 30% so that you encourage contractors to collect mobilization fees and run away. So we need some fundamental rethinking of how we want to run our economy as we are liberalizing we ask ourselves, in which key strategic sectors must we get more resources? What are we doing with the money that is coming from the housing fund over the years? Or what have we done with it? How do we create more wealth and value by giving more homes to Nigerians? What can we do in that direction? How can we put more value into our health system through improving universal health coverage, through the health insurance system, increasing the reach of the current health insurance system? How can we do quite a couple of things, even if it is our roads? How can we begin to invest more in roads without necessarily borrowing more money? Ideas are out there. They've been there for decades. Only if you bring the right people, okay, the best brains to run the face of government in such a critical time like this, shall we begin to explore and tap on this knowledge. Currently, we don't have our first 11 in government. I've made this point time and time and over and over again. And in a critical period like this, we must search out for our best and then put them in positions where they can effect change. And that will be the beginning of a consensus, building a consensus across sectors of what needs to be done, not necessarily by borrowing, but tapping local knowledge, tapping local resources, and giving the impression to everybody that you need to contribute. But people will not contribute when you have the National Assembly, the kind of money they are packing up. And then the Senate president says that Nigerians should stop complaining of the humongous amount of money they're spending, but rather we should wait until 2023. When you tell that to somebody who is paying tax, what impression are you making on him? So he should allow you to continue wasting his tax money, his sweats, until 2023. You are not even sorry. You are not trying to make amends. So that is not the way to go. So I believe we can come out of recession very quickly, but all hands must be on deck, and we need can do afford to do that. Uh, thank you for that submission. Uh, let's take this call. I'll, I'll come back to you again, Eze uh, Onyekwere. Uh, I'll come back to you shortly. But let's take this call coming from Taraba State. Mishak is calling us from Taraba State. Mishak, good morning. Yeah, on this issue of uh, federal government and also, I think our government, uh, they are being sincere. They don't have to, they only care about themselves. I am a student. For instance, in school, uh, the hotel has also contained two students. They have six students inside. No bunk, no mattress. So our government is just in and they don't care about the students. They only care about their pockets and their family. That's all. So all right, Mishak, I'm in support thank of you. this absolute strike. All right, Mishak, thank you for your submission. Thank you. Uh, let, let me still stay with uh, Ms. Onyekwere. I'm enjoying the conversation around the recession and the economy. Of course, I'm sure she, would, uh, uh, she wouldn't bother much about that. Uh, the truth for me here is um, I've listened to some few experts who had, who had asked government to begin to spend its way out of recession. We heard that a lot when we went to the first recession in 2017. Spend your way out of recession. And then luckily for us, the price of crude appreciated and boom, we're out of recession. Now we are back in another recession and people are saying, spend your way out of recession. I'm, and I'm asking, where is the money to be spent? Uh, looking at the 2021 budget, uh, you can see that um, uh, our government revenue is barely 30% of that um, expected um, spending. So where do we go from here in terms of spending our way out of this recession? It cannot be a question of spending your way out of recession because the money is not there. Uh, you recall that uh, January to June, we used about 98 to 99 percent of all our income to service debts. January to August, the situation improved a little. We used about 85 point something percent of all our income to service debt. So the implication is that, is that even salaries and capital expenditure we are running is more or less on borrowed money. So my own humble submission will be make prudent decisions as a way to come out of recession prudent decisions which means the little you have make the best use of it and then see where there are leakages block them the monies for instance if you read the auditor general's report 2014 to 2017 it says in no clear terms that we have between 8 and 10 trillion naira in the hands of the leadership 
of various MDs, which is supposed to have come either to the Federation Account for Sharing or to the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the federal government, which they fail, refuse, and neglect to remit. You start with the big ones. Between NMPC, FIRS, and DPR, they have 5.876 trillion. They fail to account for the Federation account. Meanwhile, NMPC alone is to account for about 4.5 trillion, and the others, they balance. And we have a 2021 budget, which is looking at a deficit of about 5.2 trillion. And of that 5.2 trillion, we want to borrow 4.2 trillion. So why don't we go after these people who are holding our money, get that money out of them as a starting point? That's why I'm saying, let's use prudence to get our, out, our way out of uh, the recession because there is no more money to borrow. Nobody's going to keep lending money when we have lost the capacity to repay, unless we want to get this country declared bankrupt. Because if Nigeria was a going concern, paying back 85, using 85% of revenue to pay debt, debtors will have come to declare the, uh, the, the company to take whatever they can get before you finally close shop. So it is a question of let's recover what we have. Even the little money that is budgeted for the sectors, let's make sure it is spent on the basis and the purpose of appropriation. And then we can begin to think, are there loopholes? Are there people who are not in the tax net? Are there taxes that are leaking? We get it, first of all, before we now begin to think, do we need much more money? When a family has problems, it is usual for the head of the family to call everybody together to say, gentlemen and ladies, we used to make 100,000, now we are making 50. And just jointly sit down and agree to cut out things that are not necessary and maintain the basics. You pay your rent, you send children to school, you maintain health care, you buy credits for your electricity, and then cut out the remaining. That's what we're expected to do. It's not like the money is no longer there and people are still insisting on living larger than life. National Assembly wouldn't cut off anything. Uh, and then PC will keep holding money. All the ministries, departments, and agencies will want to continue driving SUVs. And then where, where do we go from there? That's not the way to behave when the money is no more there. You must cut down. And for instance, let's take the example of the Disabilities Commission. The Disabilities Commission was just set up around September, October. That's when the president appointed the leadership. And I just checked the 2021 budget proposal. Already, their personnel vote they're asking for is about 789 million. So you ask yourself between September and when the budget was made, I think the budget was sent September, early October, how did they employ people that will take 780 something million naira in a year? So we can't continue pretending that or the, we don't have, we say we don't have money and we keep doing those things that will cost money. All is not well. Let the government come clean. Let them come straight. Let them be accountable. Let them open up the books so that Nigerians can see. You don't get a commission in September, October, and by, by the time you are submitting a budget, they're already looking for 780 something million to pay salaries. Who are those that are going to pay? So it's a cruel joke. We can afford to get out of the recession by managing ourselves more prudently and getting the monies due to us that some people are holding. But, I mean, uh, very good for that angle. Let's come back to our Lagos studios where we have is a Luce. Uh, so, one thing that I was expecting you would say, I'm coming back to the education because we're talking about economy. If there's no education, what are we building on in any nation of the world? Education is very key. What would be your recipe to a permanent for a permanent solution to the federal government as to issues? These things have been happening since I was in school. And it's so, it's so shocking that we still have to record it in 2020. Well, uh, thank you. Let me just um, touch a bit on what Ezra Nekwere said in For a, a very, just very briefly, yes. yes. You see, we keep on copying and pasting what happens elsewhere. They've mentioned spend our way out of um, recession. recession. I mean, how does that apply to Nigeria? We have to be realistic. This government keeps on borrowing and they'll borrow again tomorrow. They'll borrow next tomorrow. So, I mean, there's lack of seriousness in the whole process. With regards to the funding as to the ASU uh, government uh, crisis, you see, we cannot reinvent the wheel. Nobody's talking of reinvent. We're trying to reinvent the wheel, bringing in some kind of IPP, whatever scheme that is, should be used to pay lecturers. All over the world, in our neighboring African countries, lecturers are being paid salaries. Schools are functioning, they've been running. What is the template they are using? You don't begin just from nowhere as if we're having different kind of universities in Nigeria from what happens in Lome, uh, Ghana, the United Kingdom, wherever else. Take the template they have over there and use it on Nigeria. 
But you bring in very bogus schemes, scams actually, that they have no place in reality, and you try to force it down on the lecturers here. I mean, like, you see, we, until we are, we're not even serious with ourselves. The guys who are ruling this country have, don't have their children in these schools. So if these schools can be closed down for the next five years, they don't keep it down. So until Nigerians become more proactive, until we become more engaging, we now begin to demand. We should not leave this issue to only us. Because that is the problem we're having. We're saying it is their own problem. Let us fight their own fight. But everybody here has one or two relations who are sitting down at home who have wasted one year. We now have another batch of um, senior secondary school students yes. who cannot even get into university because the ones that are there have virtually spent one year doing nothing. So the backlog, in fact, in schools now, they call them SS4. I mean, in most schools, because you have senior secondary schools who should end, go out when they are in SS3, they are now in SS4. So the, the backlog on the effect on the families, is, you cannot even begin to quantify it. But everybody is relaxed. It is not our problem. It is the ASU's problem. Oh. And I mean, until we, we, we decide that each person's problem is our, the next person's problem and we begin to address it holistically, we'll keep on having these problems. All right, uh, we'll, we'll take a break. When we'll come back, um, we'll continue this conversation. Just hold your thoughts. I have a question to ask, but that will come shortly after the break. So stay with us. You can now stream Silverbird News 24 live on mobile app. All you need to do is to download Silverbird News 24 app from Google Play Store on your Android devices and App Store or on your Apple devices. Tap the live button at the bottom bar to watch us live 24-7. You can enjoy all our news programs including PG News and Program. Silverbird News 24. The news never stops. For more news stories, kindly visit our website www.silverbednews24.com. You can also watch trending news videos on our YouTube channel. We are just a click away on WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Get the news in your prime on your mobile phone by downloading Silverbed News 24 from your Play or App Store. File in your witness report on our website or send an email to silverbedn24 at gmail.com. You're still watching News Up here at the city of Lagos. We still have uh, Eze Luce, a legal practitioner here in our Lagos studio. We also have um, Eze Onyekwere in our Buja studio and also Dr. Giv Tumulu in our Port Harcourt studio. The conversation, like you all know, it's around a recession and ways out of recession. As when yeah. government um, um, has um, strike matters lingered for too long. Uh, but now I want to shift grounds. Let's look at the International Day uh, for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Let me throw this to uh, Dr. Gif Tuonlu. Yes, um, you've been quiet for a while. Let me engage you on this matter. Uh, how, how bad is this violence against women in Nigeria as we speak? How bad is it from your perspective? They would have to unmute your, your audio there. You're still, on, you're still muted. They would have to unmute your audio there. Yes, if they've done that, you can speak now. All right, we'll, we'll get back to you in a bit, Mr. Uh, uh, doctor there. All right? We'll get back to you in a bit. We know that you're really itching to talk. So let's just be together. He's back. It's back, though, yes. Okay, Dr. Gates. Yeah, okay. okay, so... I was saying that the statistics is quite uh, bad and, and disturbing um, all over the country. And in fact, in, in many other parts of the world, violence has become like a new normal. Um, rising terrorism, rape, um, trafficking in women, sexual harassment, domestic violence against women, and so on and so forth. It's, it's quite alarming. And, during this pandemic, 
from the um, research done by FIDA and some other organizations, it even increased. And it is something that we should worry about because the women folk represents to me a very important segment of, of the population. And we cannot play with our women, we cannot play with our girls and our mothers because they are nation builders. They are a critical segment that we need to take very good care of if we are to go anywhere as a country. Now, when this kind of situation arises anywhere, you expect that people will talk about it. And that is why the United Nations now has put aside a day for us to create awareness about this issue, for us to bring out um, the statistics about the rates at which women are being abused, killed, raped, and all of that. And then to, to make people understand that it is not something that we should fold our hands and allow to continue. And that we need to begin to do something about it so that at the end of the day, we can reduce this, this um, high rate of incidence of um, abuse and molestation of women and then allow women to freely express themselves and participate you know in, in in the scheme of things so it is it is it is something that we also need to begin to look at um the the break down the statistics to say what parts of the country we have these things more and what are the causes of this uh, you know uh, problem and of course what are the possible solutions to it but like i said it is quite alarming it is quite high and it, it is it should disturb anybody that still has his humanity intact bring it back to this uh let's take you also to uh, abuja studios before we come to this to uh, live studios here in lagos and speak with uh, mr inquiry there women our mothers our wives our daughters will become you know since the issue of COVID-19 setting, it, it was as if people's eyes began, you know, just got opened. Like we never ha had it this bad. That's what some people would say. How would you describe the kind of violence against women that, that have been reported all over the world? Now let's narrow it down to Nigeria. Pre-COVID-19, during COVID-19 as we speak, and how can we protect women against such violence moving forward? Well, let me start by saying that uh, the violence as a conduct by any person at all is something that should have been regulated by law or is already regulated by law. And part of why violence continues in all its ramifications is the failure to apply sanctions, uh, law enforcement investigating issues, applying the relevant sanctions, and also the patriarchal society which we all belong in. So my thinking is, first of all, we should look at the extant laws, the laws as they are today, seek to enforce them. And where there are loopholes in the law, where is the mischief in the existing law, we make new laws and policies to regulate those loose ends. And then a lot of sensitization and education will take place uh, because violence is not just about physical violence. There are violence that is relating to denying people access to healthcare, violence relating to denying people education, you know, if you educate somebody, he will be able to get informed and be able to challenge those societal precepts that stick to hold him down. So violence is not just a physical thing. It's there in education. It's there in healthcare. It's there even in the workplace. So the whole idea is that a number of stakeholders are coming together now as we are celebrating these uh, international days of elimination of violence against women. We have government coming in. We have civil society. We have the media. And then I think the private sector should weigh in. Let it be a message that he told everywhere in the families, in the mosque, in the church, in the marketplace, okay. in school, so that the younger ones get properly educated and socialized with it, that as they grow, they internalize it to know that it is something that is wrong and something that should never be allowed to happen. And wherever it happens, nobody right. should conceal it right. and it so should be brought to the fore. All right, thank you. One moment. Let's speak with Richard, who's calling us from Plateau State. Richard, good morning. Thanks for joining us on News Hub. Hello. Hello, Richard. You're welcome to News Hub. Thank you. Please go ahead with your contribution. What do you have to say today? Good morning. Thank you. Uh, uh, concerning ASU, I think the members of the public... Okay, I think the members of the public are wrongly informed with what is happening in ASU. 
in the first place, ASU has not been on strike for six months or seven months. What happened is uh, ASU has been on strike in February for two weeks. Going to the third uh, uh, I mean week, federal government declared the schools closed because of COVID-19. This has not happened. I mean, the schools have not opened until September, Richard. October, when the federal government wanted to um, to open these schools. So people should understand this. ASU had... Richard, ASU had been on strike before that. then. The, the, at loggerheads with the federal the, government. The, fighting on arguments from 2009 down to even this present administration, just to just straighten that uh, uh, out with you. Uh, well, how do you conclude on your thoughts this morning? Uh, of uh, labor. Well, I mean, was behaving one kind. You know, it is high time he goes. Why would he wait until one to go on strike before he starts negotiation? Concerning statistics for this country, I'm sorry to say, our population is not, is, 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 is wrong. We don't have a population figure now because of the statistics we have at hand. Inflation figures is wrong. Everything concerning statistics in this country is wrong. Unless we are able to get the correct statistics, even our budgetary uh, allocations will not be done properly. So okay, please, Richard. people, members of the public should know this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for calling. And so uh, let's round it off with you on that new line of thought, uh, talking about elimination of violence against women. You're about to round it up on that line, uh, Mr. Yekwere. Yes, what I was saying is that uh, children should be socialized. It should be something taught in our educational institutions. And I made mention of enforcing relevant laws and where there are loopholes in the law, bringing in new laws and new policies to make sure that the mischief is out. So in essence, it is a whole of society effort. It's not for women alone, it's not for FIDA alone. And once we understand it as a whole of society effort, we are talking about bringing the competencies of one half of the population to bear in development, making sure they get the opportunity to do what they're supposed to do, because you cannot clap with one hand. And that's part of the challenge in Nigeria. That is only the male folk that are dominating the environment, that are dominating governance. And what they've been doing as their best is not good enough. So everybody should be allowed to participate in development as it's a people's work in progress. And violence against women hampers women's participation in public, social, or private life. Thank you so much, um, uh, let's, let's come back to Lagos. Um, uh, is, there, uh, is there a correlation between um, economic hardship and what we are experiencing in terms of violence against women? Oh, certainly. I mean, um, the level of violence uh, on, we, on women is higher, most likely at the um, lower Domestic strata level. of society. Because when you don't have enough uh, to maybe allow for leisure, you tend to like get physical, I mean, I'm talking about physical violence in this case. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like as I said, uh, violence against women is not just the physical aspect of it. So when you go beyond the physical, when you go to the emotional, it applies everywhere, irrespective of um, economic strata. You could be a billionaire, but you could still perpetrate violence on the women in your environment. Um, but like as you also said, the the women, the women folk constitute at least fifty percent of this population. So when the society allows violence against women to inhibit them from optimizing their opportunities, potentials, potentials it actually means that society cannot move much forward. I mean, so the, every society that wants to make progress has to put all it can to ensure that all populations, all segments of population, the male and the female, are allowed and are able to achieve their uh, maximum potentials. And uh, one, of, one way of doing that is to eliminate uh, violence against women. Do, do, you think, do you think we have enough laws protecting the women, Nigerian women? I believe so. You see, the, the problem, we, we've, had, we've had enough laws from, right from the onset. I mean, the, you know, there is no law that allows you to perpetrate violence on anybody. No law allows you to rape or to um, marry off um, young uh, sure girls. Goes. So it is, there, are, there are enough laws, but the issue has always been the capacity to enforce these laws. And then to also sensitize the, the people on the grassroots to understand that when you pin down your girl child, you actually pin down yourself. Because yeah. those, who have, uh, those who are parents realize that it is actually the female child, the girl child that actually takes care of the parents. 
the male child is always focused on his family. So violence against women is, uh, is, is one of those debilitating factors that actually pulls back our society. Okay. And it's in our own best interest to ensure that we eliminate violence against women. All right. Uh, before I take it to uh, <laughs> Dr. Gift there, maybe for the first time you agreed to that one statistics <laughs> was right. It says 50%. So maybe you, you agreed <laughs> on that statistics. No, I mean, it's, not, it's, it's not statistics from anybody. It's like when you go to maternity, you can observe it. You Most families, you can observe this. These are very empirical that was facts. What statistics in your family? In my family? Yes. One your immediate family. In my immediate family, no, we, are, we, we are 15. Family. And we have eight men, seven girls. Oh, so? So it's yeah. almost 50%. Yeah, almost, oh, in my family, it's no, much no, I mean, more. It's almost in my family, yes. we are, we are, we are eight, eight, in, eight in number, yes. six men and two females. Good. But and my father too had more boys. <laughs> oh, sure. So I no. think this, maybe you want to be like, maybe on a lighter mode, okay, ladies yes. and gentlemen, maybe we want to check the MP, the National Population Commission ought to give us, you know, the correct data. Well, we'll come to that before the end of the show. <laughs> Let me take back to you, Gift, in Port Harcourt. We have to round off right now. So, um, your closing remarks on the three things we've talked about today in just 30 seconds. If you can, try 40. Hmm. All right. We Dr. To Gift, to think about economy, will you please your closing remarks on the program today? Okay. Thank you. So, uh, as I was saying, the, the economy has to be looked at holistically, and we need to understand that what happens in the economy is sometimes explained by what happens in other parts of the, the system as a whole. Then, talking about ASU and federal government, I, I said the, the, the problem is avoidable, uh, and it, it boils down to the way we make decisions. Federal government, or any government for that matter, should not make decisions concerning the people without finding a way to involve the people in those decisions. And then finally, when it comes to violence against women, we need to create more awareness. We need to understand that our women matter. And we also uh, need to uh, bring about programs that will make people change their mindset about women. Culturally, we have a bias against women. And then when it comes to laws, we should make laws and unsparingly you know, enforce those laws so that offenders get punished and those who want to go into uh, that, those kinds of behavior are deterred. Thank you. Dr. Gift Wolu for your submission there. And a very big thank you. Uh, as a Onyekwere in Abuja studio, I need to have a personal conversation with you after the show. We need to do quite a lot together. Uh, yes, thank you so very much for your time on the show. And then um, as a um, Eluche, Eze, Eze, Onyekwere, yeah. Eluche. Um, yes, I think I'm right here. Thank you for your time on the program. We appreciate it. Thank you. And for all our callers that, uh, that called and for all that attempted to get across to us, thank you for your calling. And we'll take a break and we'll come back. Uh, we'll wrap, wrap up the show. Precise. I give you one. Uh, one of the duties of uh, SSS, for instance, is to investigate the crimes, economic crimes of national security level. Good. So, what is an economic and financial crime? So, 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 so you find that, that in between these two organizations, everybody wants want to, to investigate, investigate or be responsible, responsible for anything, anything that, that is economic. economic. Two. Two. Oh, oh, so so the laws, laws that, that have been made, made now has, has removed, removed some, some responsibilities, responsibilities from, from one, one group, group to another. another. But, but the original uh, regulation, regulation has uh, not changed. It's not changed. changed. The Let foundation on which, they, on which they operate. All right, yeah, I just saw uh, a video. We, the news got to us on Thursday uh, that we lost one of the very profound contributors 
on our program news hub, even from uh, Silla Bird News, uh, STV Today. He was with us. He contributed immensely. His line of thoughts, very, very wonderful. And uh, we got the news of the passing of retired Colonel Olani uh, Pekumacho Yube. Uh, he was aged 70 years and we got confirmation from family and friends. We want to pray that the Lord will give his family and friends the fortitude to bear the irreparable loss. Um, such a very painful one, but rest in peace, uh, Colonel. Yes, um, rest in peace, Colonel. Oh, Lani we will dearly miss you, no we'll doubt. Miss you. Uh, he was he was born he was born on in, in 1950. He's aged 70. He studied at OAU 1971 to 1974. He attended the United States Institute of Military Assistance, uh, Fort Bragg, and North Carolina, uh, USA. Director of Intelligence Production Center, Directorate of Military intelligence from 1994 to 1998. Baba died uh, on November 25th. Uh, pretty sad news there coming to us there. We wish the family um, all, all the comfort. We pray that God would um, give them the comfort to bear uh, this irreparable loss. Nigeria would miss Baba's contribution to issues around security. We would miss having him in our studios um, as often as we can. That's it. There sad one there. Peace, sad one there. Sad one there. Right. Anyways, that's our show today. That's a show. Thank you so That's much for watching. Yeah. Uh, the uh, show will return on Monday, 7 o'clock. I am Shim Wei. Did you have a beautiful weekend? And I'm David Babadiki. Do have yourself a splendid, splendid weekend, but please stay safe. COVID 19 is still very real. Bye for now.